Well, let's so let's let's review a little bit where we are and where do we go from here. So, where's my um, zoom? I put it up. Where there. is that? Crashed. Crashed on you. Mm. Okay. So, so we are recording. Yeah, we're we're in a, in a Zoom meeting as well. So I'm sharing my let's see, sharing my screen. Now there there it's back. Um, okay. Just a brief review of yesterday. So yesterday we uh, we tried to line the pond. We we started hanging the towers. Um, by the way, the news is uh, we're looking at trout. Trout gets stressed above 60. So I, I called to get get those things delivered. So the recommendation was actually to do go with with catfish, oh. and that's that's the idea. So we're gonna we're gonna get a a bunch of those. I get a hundred of them. But we can populate. They're actually not open on the weekend. I, I tried calling today, but you have to order it like the night before. Mm. So um, we we can do that uh, and seed them in there Monday. But that's. Um, we can do things like start the plants today. Uh, so we're working on, for example, the the mushrooms. We're doing the buckets. We're inoculating them. Basically, we've got like this four four pound bag of spawn, mm -hmm. which uh, they'll last you probably like four or five buckets maybe. Um, so you you basically do, but you gotta clean out the, make sure the the medium is free of all other germs and bacteria, fun fungi competitors. And to do that, you either do things like uh, ferment the straw underwater for like a week or two, a couple of weeks. You can do things like peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, or potassium hydroxide, or other acids or bases, or ozone. So we've got ozonator, so we can do that. That's like a thing which, which creates ozone O3 out of the air, so it's a local resource that you can use. That's a, it's a really good one for all kinds of this purification work. Like, say we've got even the biodigester water or fish water that you really want to knock out all the biological life, settle it all out. The ozonator will do that. It oxidizes everything in there, meaning that it kill it kills it. So the the fungus can grow in the straw if you put. I would say like a day or two of ozonation. You want to also wet the wet the straw for um, why why wet it? Well, the the fungus needs to have a lot of moisture, so it's a good idea to to do that when you're ozonating because otherwise, if you try to wet it afterwards, I mean, the water will have all kinds of uh, microbes in in there as well. Even though it's got some chloramine in there too, but uh, you want to ozonate everything. Ozone is a pretty strong oxidizer, so that should work and actually it's a it's an experiment because actually have you know looking at all the inoculation methods and sterilization methods you hear a lot about cooking the medium so it's free of germs using substances using fermentation well substances like acids or bases actually I haven't seen uh, just in a brief brief search I really haven't seen anyone doing ozone but we do know that ozone is a quite an active oxidant or purifier so things like whether you're trying to keep mold down in your house, that's the ozonator does that. Like say you got a closet that's getting moldy or a cabinet, that will just kill it all and, and prevent the spores from going all into the air. So ozone is our friend for, uh, we'll see if it works. I mean, that's, it's kind of an experiment. We've got the spawn, the spawn, where do you get spawn? Um, it's in a document, uh, where, did I, where did I get it? Field and forest. Uh, so look at field and forest. Uh, since 1983, but this is wh where we got shrooms, shroom spores, not, not sh spores, but um, grain spawn. What are we doing? We're doing grain spawn. So look in there for grain spawn. And you can get all kinds of var varieties. The, the one that's very easy to grow is oyster mushroom. So that's that's what we're doing grain spawn um, it grows very well in straw so that's what we're using we got wheat straw so these things like this uh, which one did I get I got this one um, I think I think I got this one here uh, just pick one that's that appears good but yeah um, 
that's what these things look like. You can get a bag of it for like $24 for four pounds. That's what we got. So it's relatively inexpensive. And then the harvest, uh, what do you get out of, so you pay $24, but what do you get? So these are all the varieties. There's like yellow, pink, like all kinds of, these are all oysters, oyster mushrooms. Uh, they grow well on spawn. If you had other things like wood logs or other things, you might use other, other uh, fungus, other mushrooms. I think these also would grow in, in wood as well. It's just you gotta. The question is, are you gonna sterilize it and and inoculate it properly? Uh, I guess any medium would, a lot of media would work. I mean, they they settle in grain. That's how they grow them out. So you get this. Uh, the way it looks is, uh, well, kind of looks like that. You get a bag of grains, which are like wheat, little wheat grains that you can see a little bit of white on them. I have a bag of that. Uh, let's talk about. So when we did last time, what do we do? So we go to aquaponics. Actually, uh, let's see, mushroom, I think I have got a mushroom log. Uh, but I tra tracked what are we getting at the end of the day. So I, I just kept, like, every day, they, every time they fruited. So basically, they started fruiting after two weeks, and then they had this big flush, and then, like, two weeks after, they did it again. And then the third time, did it again. Um, and every time, it was, like, a little less. But um, if you look at my days here, December 9, so November 10, we started the buckets, one four pound bag for five buckets. That's what we did. It's good to know. Um, eight ounce harvest from bucket two, one clump, blah, blah, blah. So December 9 was the first little harvest. Ten pounds. Um, so no. Um, no, no, that's just ounces. So, so I would continuously harvest this kind of stuff. Um, in terms of the time delay, well, that looks more like three weeks. Uh, November 10th, like more like three or four weeks. I mean, it was cold at that time, so maybe it took a little longer. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, I kept kept tracking this, kept tracking it, and at the, you know, just kept it coming until February. Uh, kind of ran out. So yeah, February 18, 2016, two ounce more. So it kind of started peter out, like little 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 fruiting bodies came out. Uh, February 18, started starting. Uh, December, uh, November 10. So November, December, January, February. So it's full three months, like basically one one flush per month or so, kind of three main waves. And what's the numbers at the end? Um, let's see. Total last time, 12 pounds of mushrooms produced. Total last time, 12 pounds, 12 pounds. Um, I, I've had a little spreadsheet somewhere. Where is that link? I think here. No. Let's see, where's my little spreadsheet? Um, so three pounds, four pounds, seven pounds, eight pounds, nine pounds. Um, so by January it was like 11 pounds, a lot, like a few ounces more, so 12 pounds. So we've got, um, if we talk about, we bought it for, you know, $24, we got 12, 12 pounds, so it's like $2 a pound for the spawn. Uh, yeah, there's a little cost, but yeah, 12 pounds from five buckets that were vertical, so the space, space requirement is quite low, and, and 12 pounds. It's pretty yeah, good. Important to know that uh, with a proper process, you can actually just keep growing them off of uh, the stuff that you've grown. You don't have to buy it all the time. So, as far as the spawn itself, yeah. So like you can so cut off pieces, that? and then you have to like uh, not entirely oh, yeah. the process, but you have to like uh, again, you have to like uh, have a sterilized uh, scenario and then put it in a petri dish for it to feed. And once it like grows thick, then you get pass it onto the jar, let let that uh, spread over there, and then you can. Um, put it in another uh, bucket again. Yeah, that's that's uh, what we have here. So we actually know some of those techniques in detail from Peter. Mm -hmm. um, so the twenty-four dollars you initially invested can essentially yeah. last you a lifetime. It can do this, but here's here's where we describe Liberty that. Mutual so Insurance Company presents. <laughs> um, <laughs> so so here, if you take a look at 
what's going on here. So this is the actual technique. You, you have this jar. You basically have to do, well, don't show it here. But you take the, the lid from a, on a jar. You drill two holes in it. You do the RTV silicone. I mentioned that before. And then you insert the, those segments of, of your mycelium. Uh, after, after culturing, uh, you start with a culture. Yeah, I guess Petri dish. Uh, you'd have to uh, populate it, basically make it grow a little bit. And one way to do it is inside, well, there's Petri dish. And here, when you do the actual jar, you have sugar water in there, essentially. And then they grow over all through the, the sugar water. And then this material, then you put onto the grain, you inoculate the grain with it so you can keep propagating it. So if you want to do that, uh, that's good. You have to kind of uh, get your operation operation on that to be efficient and and well organized so you can continue doing that but yeah you can start start it and then go forever uh, but 12 pounds from from one one bag of spawn so you can say that that four pounds multiplied into spawn multiplied to 12 pounds of mushrooms but that's it's like a lot I mean, when you're actually eating it. Like I had it all the time, and then <laughs> you get tired of them after yeah. some time. <laughs> but uh, it's actually dried a, dried a whole bunch. You know, just put them in jars, stuff, mm. stuff like that. Of <laughs> dried mushrooms for for eating later. Um, but we were we were talking about this here. Um, I have a question. The alternator. Yeah. Would that be covered with water, water and all the other medium inside of it, and then just bubble up through? Yeah. Through so it? we have to think about how to do it. So right now we said let's take two 55-gallon drums, cut a hole in the middle, and stack all the buckets with the with the straw. You got to wet it up, and you know put a put maybe like put a little hole for the ozonator blowhole to to blow into it, or like from underneath it, like yeah, yeah just maybe put like some kind of a um, how do we inject it at the bottom? So, so actually, uh, uh, who was who was working on that, Mike, mm -hmm. Michael? Mm -hmm. uh, he was working on that. But I think the idea is, I mean, you can. Now, well, what's the best way? If if you just drop that ozonator, just put it right down there with the buckets. You know, that's probably good enough. Um, I would probably want to shoot it where you have the ozonator on the outside, just shooting in through a little hole in the barrel, so that the hole the 255 gallon drums are kind of like airtight and you're getting a good concentration of ozone in there and ozone rises so yeah they, they do have we found two uh 55 drums that had a little uh not spigot but an outlet i guess at the bottom for yeah. damage can we just plug uh the ozone well you have to there? yeah you have to you want to do it more than I mean, that the, just, the, just so what's like an ozonator like air like a gas so yeah because it'll be a little bubble, then this gas. What do we have to work with? We have to work with this. It's liquid, yeah, but it's heavier than air. Also. So one of these things, they just, they just, it's a blower. It's, it's got this high voltage grid inside of it, and it blows air through it. That's all an ozonator does. It, the high voltage zaps. It electrolyzes. Um, what's, what's air? It's oxygen and nitrogen primarily. The oxygen it mm -hmm. oxidizes into like. O1 and O2, it combines into O3. So you're breaking apart molecules and then they recombine into O3 under high voltage. And the ozone, that's a highly reactive, it's a radical. It's got a free electron that oxidizes things. It's much more active than, than oxygen. So, but the blower there, it's like a hole. So you'd have to go from a, do like a, take a three inch hole saw maybe do a little tube and put it in front of it because uh you can put this thing inside but i'm wondering whether if you like recirculating that ozone in there you might not get the fresh ozone made like if you're zapping ozone that's already been made yeah. you're probably mm -hmm. like not being very efficient so you probably want to put this outside blow it through on the inside the other way to do it was would be i would think it how would you sterilize a 250 gallon container of water the tote uh, i just say Take this, put a chamber in front of it, and put a, a few pumps of your little aquarium pumps in there. So the pumps are now blowing that air with ozone through air stones into into liquid water. So that's one way to inject ozone. Mm -hmm. I think that's like a like a gutter punk or just a <laughs> DIY way to it's to get a good. cool ozonator set up, as opposed to like if you buy try to get like a 
water purification ozonator at the store will be like thousands of dollars mm -hmm. so so just do that you're the point is you're shooting in air that's got a high fraction of ozone in it that should work now i have no idea how well it works i don't have any data or experience with yeah. it but that's just the first principles analysis just inject ozonated air into whatever you want to purify and yeah. then make sure you have you just have enough of it so maybe like one pump might work so much i mean the one the pump pumps we use have 45 liter per minute air airflow rates so i mean that's you know that's significant you can do some calculations to see uh, how many you know how many air uh, you know how many how much volume or how much air exchange you think liberty mutual insurance company so, presents yeah so, uh, take away the tab is it, it all the place yeah um let's see let's do the let's look at the right so so that will be a way um what else to show here uh, as far as the this container of water yeah it turns out 1000 gallons weighs 8000 pounds <laughs> it's not 4000 uh, it's 4000 kilos so it's more like 8000 pounds that we got in there so we're hanging up the tower hangers and uh, I need one person to help me. To hang the towers? Yeah. All right. If anybody wants to go outside. Yeah. Um. We had a, we had a trouble with this liner. That lead liner we had in the shop and it might have gotten too old, but it leaked. Make leaked a little bit, so we, we replaced it. Mm -hmm. So here we've got... Um, Feel like that's when we were sucking the water back out because we noticed there was little wet spots. We're thinking, mm -hmm. what's happening here? Uh, so we did a suction system. Just uh, started with a submersible pump, and then took off the hose and submerged it, and it kind of leaked out all the water. Uh, so that's what we did. And we kind of left it at the day, then started raining. So um, and we had more water when we came back, and Penny and I drained the rest of it. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's what happened, um, but we're ready for for some uh, catfish. So it turns out, yeah, catfish do well in the cool. They, uh, as we were initially saying, okay, get some uh, trout, but the guy said they get stressed out above sixty. Oh. Trout stresses out above sixty, and we're gonna have above sixty in the summer. So that would have been uh, good for a pool so that's buried. Good. Trout would have been good. Yeah, possibly. Uh, that that pond. Possibly. Um, yeah, they like the cooler ponds. So catfish, hey, the they're rats cuter. The <laughs> 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 they look better, and uh, <laughs> they'll be exciting. They're like they said, eight to ten inch fish. That's what they saw a hundred for a hundred fifty dollars. So we can stock that and watch them grow. See how much we can get them to grow before we gobble them up <laughs> <laughs> and yeah so the way we're setting it up we definitely want to try to see if we can inject some some of our, our heaters in there for the winter in case it tries to freeze on us because in january like late january like early february it's it's going to want to freeze in there so uh, we should probably put in a, a few heaters running off the solar something like that um we even have a cover that we can put on it that might be enough to keep it uh, warm. possibly possibly that yeah Shouldn't an extra cover that. Um, the thing is that we're right on the ground with the cold concrete, but then again, you've got four feet of distance from the concrete, but that will, that will communicate the, the cool, but then in the daytime, you're, you're warming it up to like 80 if, the, if it's sunny. So, uh, we'll see, we'll see how it, in practice, we can track the water temp, temps and, uh, see if, uh, I would like to invite you like to that on concrete one actually works or, or it's, uh, too cool. That's, that's a good experiment. Um, I would imagine... From from our experience, I mean, we never had the the ponds freeze inside. We only had them get like almost frozen. We were continuing to circulate the water on cold days, even. But on cold days, like when it's overcast, well, basically when you ha when we had snow, our experience was that okay, you get no heating because it's snow covered, and then it's pretty freezing in there. We were still circulating the water, and it started. You can see st a little bit of start of freezing on the towers, like with the water, um, but we never saw ice on the ponds, the in-ground ponds themselves, mm -hmm. when we did not heat. That that stayed 
stayed like that the whole winter without freezing over so here uh, what's the difference well it's actually even more exposed because it's above ground so it probably would want to freeze on you so probably probably extra heating would would uh, would do it but once again we talked about the very simple submersible heater made out of a, a heater tank element so you could do that uh, for the for the inoculating the mushrooms we can yeah uh, set up the ozonator to just do a little feed pipe uh, something I would like four inch PVC or something get get that right next to the barrel and yeah as long as we're shooting that we don't have to be super airtight because the air I mean we're blowing air into it so you get positive pressure so it'll just keep filled with the ozone and that that would work and just keep it like overnight and we can probably like seed it up tomorrow so what else is there in process there's uh, what's the deal for um, yeah on the row bed what's uh, did anyone see what the latest status on that? Ken, the, what's the, uh, what's the well, status on that? We, we, we haven't yet started on it. We've just done the design. Okay. Yeah, so uh, uh, Paul checking the design. I don't know if he had started it. He had, I didn't see him come to lunch either, so he could be working on it right now. I saw like four ch long tray things that looked like they were recently. We could use them. We should built. use them. We should hang them on, um, on the walls. Uh, let's actually grab them. So that's growing beds, like... T uh, shelf-like beds but not with flow through that we don't have a provision there for flow through um, but we could in fact we we actually should well first let's hang them up put polyethylene on the inside they're actually yeah put polyethylene on the inside to protect the wood and we can consider doing the the flow the, those flow through uh, fittings but we'd have to print them out print them out if we, uh, unless we take them off the other greenhouse so we, it's something we can retrofit, but maybe, um, yeah, let's, let's see if we can hang them. I mean, first step is to hang them and uh, we can print out, yeah, maybe we can print out some of those fittings. Um, but we don't have to do those fittings because in this system, it's where you're basically flowing. You're not trying to retain the water. The fitting was there specifically so you, you flood it for like an hour or two before all the water weeps out. Here, we just need to water. So a simple uh, connection, uh, what can we use there? We can just do um, even like, what fittings do we have right now that could do it? I mean, we could just glue in some PVC pipe, a little thread in like a, you know, like a one inch pipe, drill a one inch hole, thread in like one inch pipe and just have it flow flow throughout the bottom um, or even like um, something like that you have to make that I mean yeah I mean it will flow from top to bottom I mean those containers are not sealed up unless you would do a thorough job on on the polyethylene so they'll just kind of dribble down but I guess if we just gluing in a something that has a flange so we can actually screw it in maybe like a flanged fitting we should probably have some of that in our fittings repo so uh, we can take a look at what we've got there uh, so then the idea there is like automation part we're supposed to do that tomorrow but basically you can have when we once we have the submersible pump we've got a bunch of the we've got a bunch of the uh, solenoids. We've got as many solenoids as we want so we can connect any amount of watering points to our little control and we should do that tomorrow for the automation part. So the washer solenoids we've got a bunch of like 20 of them, whatever 20 channels or something so we can uh, a nice idea would be you're watering into those towers from the fish water for like five minutes or something or whatever schedule we decide and then it flows back into the pond uh, so if we wanted to do that, they would have to be like higher than the pond itself. Could probably hang one or two of them that are higher mm. on a back wall. We could, for example, do that. Uh, we we can see, but yeah, let's bring them out and see what we can do. Easy way to do the in terms of the because that's going to be super super heavy. I mean that's that's soil. Yeah. Um, so let's do again the the trick with making it as humusy as possible, meaning put in loaded with straw and then put in pockets of soil as a good way to inoculate that with the environment for plants to grow. So that'll decompose and, and 
Does just like we have anything to do with hum humic acid? Hu yeah, I just made that word up, but hu <laughs> like humus, humus. That's the type Not of soil, right? Yeah, it's it's just decomposed, <laughs> decomposed biomass. Yeah, but so um, the straw does well on that. <coughs> uh, it's a lightweight medium that turns into humus. So that's a that's a way to start if you don't have medium. We do have that big bale, and I was there to mulch around the build site, but that's also, the bales are very useful on a farm. You can do all kinds of biological stuff with them, like the food for the mushrooms, or here now, the grow beds. That's a, that's a very easy way to do it. I mean, you can buy all kinds of medium, like we talked about the expanded clay pellets, which, which are pretty expensive, but um, you can do this too. Like the most elite way to, would be like perhaps bed full of perlite, um, but the perlite isn't cheap, it's lightweight, so that would be a good thing, um, but how much is perlite? Yes, are the like those plastic microgreen type trees usable for these uh, type of situations? I don't know what they cost, but is that not just the right? Uh, well, yeah, but so so what's the concept for for the tray for the shelves? It's for root crops. So say like you want a carrot or a daikon radish that's this big. Yeah, that's you can't do it in a small tray. Yeah. So here you want that depth of soil. So you're actually getting root crops, which are um, which produce a lot actually root crops produce a lot of a lot of biomass it's like 10 tons or like beets like 20 tons per acre I mean it's, it's pretty insane quantities um, or maybe uh, sweet potato which which is also pretty high yielding it's also like what's the a sweet potato per acre sweet potato sweet potatoes going right home right now Ooh. yield per acre it's in, insane like 20,000 pounds per acre, so 10 tons, yeah, that's a lot. Um, you can grow quite a bit of it. They grow actually very well in that. Uh, they just take all, they, they climb all over, they have these nice flowers, uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, but that's, the intent there is soil medium where you have things that need roots, like, like your root crop yeah. and other things you want to plant. Um, so that we can do uh, in addition to the soil bed we can if we have time we can start seeding things so um, can we start seeding things or are we pretty much tied up with other stuff so the towers we want to hang them are they all like starting to hang or I think you got it now it was a little mm -hmm. confused mm -hmm. uh, and if not Jeff can help them do we need the net pots or yeah we do we've, we've, uh, we could use net pots we can use the the deep pots we've got like a hundred or so net pots we've got thousands of deep pots so let's take out a bunch of trays where we put in soil into those and actually seed it just by hand so i got a bunch of seeds like 20 different vegetable types uh yeah let's bring that out there and do it um yeah uh if we have how many plants do we need to seed we've got towers like i don't know like 11 times at least 11 times uh 20, so 220 at least. That would be a good start. Because we're, we're growing like three foot sections, maybe a little more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess one thing we're noticing here is that the height of the greenhouse is so low that you can only fit like, like that three foot section above the pond, um, which would be a case for doing longer things like outside the pond, but then you have to do the something um, to catch the water from it. Um, but that's doable. Like. Um, we can see how much space we take up. I mean, there's plenty of nutrients and water to fertilize much more. So we can like hang more towers in different places and things like that. Um, we also have some gutters where uh, the Zola and duckweed should actually have arrived. So we have <coughs> gutters of that. Uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of getting into a packed day, but we have gutters where the idea there was you're flowing from one tray to the next. You'd have to put a little fitting where you, you're connecting that. We've got plenty of fittings um, where you're connecting that from one, one tray to the next, one below it. Uh, we can hang those if you like. But yeah, seeding. How do you seed? You, you fill up. So I guess a good place to look at what we've done with the seeding is if, if we use the uh, so under aquaponic greenhouse so once again like we were seeding the planting the nuts out so you fill fill your trays up uh, so okay so those are the little net pots uh, 
the idea there would be to you plow your field of perlite. So we, we actually have this. We have these actually sitting ready to be planted. Uh, so you have this field of perlite. Might as well bury the net pots, plow over them, like level the ground with your hand, plow with your hand, um, and then drop a seed in each so that when you take it out, you don't have to pull it out of the perlite first. You, you pull out the net pot. That's a good way to go. Um, so that's, that's that technique. Um, this is what happens. I mean, you can tell from this that if you have lettuce seeded and started like this, whenever you pull it out, that's actually Chinese cabbage here, lettuce here. Uh, th those are the actual starts of the stuff you see in the towers later on. But you can probably imagine that the roots get all tangled up, so you, you kind of injure the plant more if you just work from this than if than if you. Um, yeah, that's that's how the growing bed looks look like. Man, it's it's nice and juicy. Um, so that's that's the advantage. Like there, you have a very nice environment for all your plants. So that's how the shrooms start out first. You'll see. Yeah, you'll start. That's what you start seeing. Like all of a sudden, and then all of a sudden they just explode. It's like that's day one, day two. There, it's like a clump like this. It's pretty cool. Um, um, let's see, uh, showing the, I wanted to show some of the, the pots. Oh yeah, so here we're actually culturing the, we injected, this is the jar thing where we injected the, the culture medium and that's where the mushrooms were growing un until you can actually seed, uh, basically pour that on grain spawn that's been uh, cooked, cooked grain spawn, you put that, uh, that over the grain spawn and mm -hmm. make it the dark clump, is there like a tube in there and, and put a little something? The dark clump is actually the, uh, I think that's mushroom. the mushroom mass, but this ended up dying off, uh, it got contaminated, so <laughs> I'm not sure if those are actually still alive or not, but they, they start forming clumps and or like strands, like you can see those kind of strands in there, um, but yeah, then, then it kind of died off on us. Um, you were trying to be... Um, to replicate from your harvest. We're trying, okay, we actually started with, you can buy, well actually we didn't buy them, we got them from Peter. Peter cultured those needles which we injected into the jar and the next step after that would have been to pour that over a cooked grain so that the grain gets infiltrated. The, the, the grain is the medium for the fungus so it just cultures over all the grain. The grain kind of turns whitish and you know that's ready, that's, that's your medium. They're not going to grow and fruit out from the grain because they don't have the right nutrients in there. They want more carbon. And uh, then you do it. So that's, uh, oh, that's, so that's a harvest of a few sweet potatoes from the greenhouse for size reference. So that's the perlite. Um, if you took on the cooked grain, you put that in the straw buckets at that point? Yep. I see. Yep. So what we bought from the store was a bag of grain. It looks like grain. It's a little whitish. Uh, how do you? Pro oh yeah, that's like full of aphids. But that's how you propagate sweet potatoes. Any of these shoots that you take off a sweet potato, if you put them in the ground, they actually grow. So it's like you can have a perpetual mm -hmm. harvest. In fact, what we found that in the greenhouse, the sweet potatoes are perennial. They there's like little bits after you harvest it. There's little bits of them that stay behind and they grow the plants next year. So it's kind of an interesting thing. It's like your permaculture and the perennial culture within a greenhouse of things that are typically annual or considered to be annual. Um, so that's, that's what we have to do this. We may have to do this for the pond. This is vitamin C. It neutralizes the chloramine in the water. So that's what we did with our ponds. Um, those are the medium towers. Um, oh no. So these were some biological things, predatory mites. So things like this, thrips eliminator. Uh, so this is bio when we're doing some of this integrated pest management. You, you release other bugs to eat things like thrips. 
or other unwanted species. Thrips are an, a definitely a big issue. Thrips and aphids are the super common things. You, you get those immediately, pretty much um, after you start a greenhouse. So you gotta you Why gotta take care of them. Thrips? What's thrips? No, like the. Um, it's this. Uh, it's these tiny mites, tiny little bugs that grow. It's a it's a jar with with medium like flakes of some some plants and just t very very tiny mites mm -hmm. um, this jar contains a minimum of 25,000 predatory mites in one liter of peat carrier so it's in peat um, so basically you spread that on the root, roots of plants and they uh, the mites go into the soil I think I don't know enough about the habits. This is kind of where you have to study the habits of where do, like say you got a thrip, thrip organism or a, or an aphid. Where where do they go to reproduce? Is it like in the soil? Is it on a leaf? Here you spread this on a leaf that on a, on a, in the soil, which means that they either need the soil to like start living and that's that's their home, and then they go up and grab the <laughs> grab the other things and come back home. I, I don't know. It's. Uh, I'm not up enough on the IPM. Um, okay, but let's talk about the pots for. So, so here we we got our towers. Um, that's that's what you do. Did you guys do that? Oh, Ken, did you do this? Uh, okay. Okay, so that's that's how you make those towers. You you heat gun it. So there's a heat gun, uh, heat gun there, and after you heat it. So after you heat gun it, you, you do the bottle, you hold it there a little bit so it cools off, and then uh, you just move the bottle right up to the next one after it's heated. Okay. <coughs> so the mop is only being uh, placed there for uh, convenience sake. The bottom of the glass is what's actually creating the opening. The bottom of the glass, yeah. yeah. The bottom of the glass bottle. <laughs> It gets you that. No, it's, it's the neck of it. That's how you stick in. Yes, yeah, the bottom of the neck. Yeah. The bottom of the neck, okay. Yeah, so you get this particular yeah. geometry, this, this pocket, this mm -hmm. outward facing pocket, and then like a little indent on the top side, so you can very conveniently place your net pot or a deep pot. So we're trying to get to the how the deep pots look. I'm sorry, that's, I, I, I'm able to You're complicate it, but were you hitting the bottom of that just now? No, he's, no, he's just holding, holding in place and heating the next slot. So just for efficiency's sake, he's holding, exactly. letting one side cool mm -hmm. off, heating the next one, and moving on. Got it, so you're, this, you're heating the plastic directly first. Mm -hmm. right. This person there has the technique. They're heating the next spot as they ream out and cool off the former, so it goes okay. faster. Yeah. Because you got to heat it maybe like, I don't know, 15 seconds. And that, but you got so many holes, you just want to get get through it. Um, so yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, that's that's how we were loading up the straw. This was the straw that was fermented, and it was all smelly, and all that. Um, so you throw in a little bit of the the white stuff is the grain form. Yeah, just a little bit. Of, that's grain. Like you can see, it's whitish because it's got some of the fungus on it. And that's the bag back there. That's the bag of grain spawn, the four pound bag that like we have right now. Um, and that's the bag of the spawn. That's how it looks like it's grains with fungus. Um, that's Peter McCoy of Radical Mycology. He's an expert, like a world leading open source expert. He's very open source. He wrote the book Radical Mycology. Uh, so we're actually working with Peter right now. I'm we're asking how do you do mycelium like Ecovative, which does mycelium packaging, that's commercial product. We're looking at that. How do you do magnesium oxide cement with that's plenty and Bob. Um, so we're talking to them, but magnesium oxide panels with mushroom insulation. That's pretty freaky. <laughs> so it's quite interesting. But this is the same technology. You have that. You put in a medium whatever medium you're inoc inoculating, you inoculate it, and then it all turns to mycelium, which becomes insulation. And the way, how do you make it survive for a long time? Well, apparently you just dehydrate it, so heat it up, autoclave it, uh, just put it in an oven for a little bit of time, and it gets really stable. It doesn't want to rot away. But because it's biological, the challenge is going to be, of course it's going to rot away sometime, because it's just biological. 
Um, so you'd have to take some, you have to figure out how to stabilize it forever or make it an airtight structure, which is like impossible. Like how do you do an airtight structure panel? I mean, that's very hard. Uh, so we could think, take out our thinking caps and see how, okay, if we make in the sandwich of, of uh, cement panels, and the idea there is magnesium oxide, which is more environmentally friendly and so forth, lighter and higher performance, actually, it's much stronger than regular concrete. But imagine that with the mycelium in the middle. That's, that's an interesting problem to see how, how you actually uh, seal it up. But I could think of ways like, say we're print, 3D printing lattices, maybe like 3D printing could come in where you can 3D print airtight structures relatively easy. So maybe that's, that's going to be the secret weapon. 3D printing plus mycelium pl plus concrete. Those are, it's a <laughs> powerful combo. So that was the bag of smelly straw that we started with. We had those in 55-gallon <laughs> drums just to keep it all together. Um, that was yeah, more of that. So, oh, yeah, so this is Ken, your question here. This is what you do. That's all it is. Just a little cut at a particular angle, so you got to just get, get that at the right angle. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. You can still do it with the cutter. Mm -hmm. No? The cutter? With you can, but it's, it's much less convenient. It's okay, much it's harder. harder to get it all yeah, you can do it. It's going to be longer. Mm -hmm. just here you just do a little... Uh, hand saw. Yeah. Well, hand saw... You do it with your teeth. Hand okay. saw, not exactly. <laughs> not that easily, because by the time you cut it, it's the angle is sh shallow here. With a saw like that, you, it's a better, yeah, perpendicular better cut. Yeah, cut. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It worked, but not quite as well as... And what is this freak show here? That's 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 when we were doing a black soldier fly breeding chamber, which had a which would have a heater inside of it and a particular lamp, which would give the right temperature and lighting environment for black soldier fly to propagate, which is which are very tricky to propagate if you want to keep culturing them forever. Uh, otherwise, you got to buy them again and again. But this wasn't open source, so we never. Actually, the guys backed out, and they wouldn't tell us how to do it. So, which type of lamp, for instance? That's the information they have. Yes, the lamp. It was the temperature schedule. You gotta, you gotta be very specific at it. It's, it's something you learn over like a few years. Mm -hmm. um, Probably some. Uh, we can figure it out. Student in Asia doing a dissertation on the yeah. black soldier flies. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. So this, this was when we were. Like that's the bigger tanks, but yeah, it takes quite a bit of people to to move that tarp in there. Uh, this was 10 mil poly, double layer, uh, always like double layer it. So, okay, but let's take a look at. So yeah, we this was all insulated like this. That's good. Um, but um, let's see. Let's look at the deep pots because that's what we want to do. Just look at looking at some of the the nutty work. Oh yeah, so this is showing the the actual this. That's what you do to culture it. So here is you first of all you heat up your medium of sugar. Here you put on your lid and then after it cools off, that's a breathing hole with the cotton. And that's an injection the red is an injection hole for the culture. So you just shoot it in there with a needle. So this is a, a kitchen top clean room environment inside that jar. Um, yeah, let's let's go back to no. I just wanted to show how we're doing the all the pots. Um, let's go to nut nut planting hazelnuts um, no now maybe go back to here let's see so yeah like so I mean so you got these pots and trays right so you got a hundred hundred of them per tray so let's plant out like tray or two, like two trays. We've got 200, the rest would be net pots. We can mix and match. Uh, we should probably make more towers then. So we got two rows of 10, but we can also hang more like on the edges, edge trusses, 
which are still over the pool, easily accessible, so we can get a few more in there. So we'll probably have like 300 or, or so uh, planting spots available immediately above the, the, the pond so we don't have to do any plumbing, extra plumbing. Um, but this would also be useful like just to plan these things out if you wanna if you wanna put it into the the other other growing chambers, growing bed, the growing bed or any other shelves or other things. So we can definitely use like two two trays of this and then like another hundred or so or two hundred of the net pots. Um, so net pots show the net pots elsewhere there yeah but it's it's just trays it's a whole tray it's a it's a plastic thing with a hundred holes on top and then the pots go into that Let's see do I have any pictures of that uh, that's the tray you see underneath there uh, it's just a plastic thing with a bunch of holes in it so um, that's what we want to plant out uh, what else is there there's uh, so that's net pots and towers when you like first put them in there they start to grow uh, what else? Uh, as far as the water system, we can we've got the pumps in the in a in a in a system right now. Well, they're laying around. We can uh, hang them and actually do what we talked about in terms of the plumbing. Mm -hmm. So going into the yesterday's dock. Um, oh. Does anyone remember what we did? Sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I don't. I wanted to, before we went too far back, I know that in the instructions, when you were talking about the straw, uh, you said something about, I guess, being able to add additives. I just wanted to quickly... Uh, For the straw additives, like, a common thing you can get is potassium hydroxide or, or sodium hydroxide or lye. Lye is potassium hydroxide. Drano, that's caustic that's a base strong base so you can inoculate the straw with that just dip that put a few scoops of your hydroxide into the water solution and let it go and it will be it will sterilize the, the life in there okay so it's not for increasing the yield or no. nutrients it's for st ad uh, sterilization additives you're saying. no and it's very strong base so it will eat you if it touches uh, you yeah the fungus is pretty stoic, it, it just needs the straw yeah. and the nutrients in it. It's like there's hardly anything in the straw, but it's enough for the fungus gotcha. to grow. Mm -hmm. okay. For the pumps, we and said we had uh, yeah. two going in the T section to one, and then another T section to split <coughs> them up, and then uh, another T section to take them down along the pipes. You can start with one, uh, one teeing off to the two sides at the top. Mm -hmm. Let's just take a look at take some notes. Who wants to do this? Take some notes here. So, um, where's our work working doc? I have it. I can link it. So, I think we went there too. I think our working dock that was a little later in this dock here that we showed it. This this is what we showed. Mm -hmm. So you're going up from. Don't worry about the second pump. Let's get the first one up there. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so let's do slide duplicate slide and say procedure. So T one to each rail and then in each rail yeah a T a T two to go along yep. the line there. Yep. Procedure. Okay. We just said that we want the ones that come up and over, or just no. We don't know yet. We're that's data that we're going to collect. We're going to find out if we want that. Okay. So, so we've got our bar in the middle. That's rebar. So the actual is this, pretty much, with a welded angle on it. So that's pretty cool. And you could see this. So when we did that, we measured, and the water was still pumping. So, so we got the right length and by the time we came back we have to squeeze it to make it fit because yes it is 8,000 pounds it was already an inch wider than what I'd originally measured yeah so <laughs> so that's that's what you get uh, have so we welded it welded it already yeah yeah sorry well, just Neil in there. finished it off I just continue doing the boring stuff then <laughs> <laughs> we shall get <laughs> in a few days 
That's fine. <laughs> oh man, are we gonna get plenty? Just for <laughs> so. <laughs> um, yes, T there. So those T's correspond to uh, this T. This is a very convenient T. It's a shark bite T. So you insert the pecs. So get the pecs. There's a red coil of pecs in a workshop in the north section. Okay. Have you seen it? Uh, uh, it's in a plumbing so, section, easy. which is a northeast uh, set of shelves. Okay. So th that would be red pecs. So actually, this is all, uh, uh, let's draw it like all our red yeah, pecs, okay. um, just to cor color correspond it. I'll fit the pipes. <laughs> so that's red pecs. Here, there's a trick. We got to get it around this. The connection we have right now is um, we took it off. But what we can do there, oh yeah, I think we have one fitting where we have the rubber rubber on already connected. So the pecs will go inside rubber hose. So then put a, uh, put a hose clamp and that will hold it. So put a hose clamp both around the outlet and around where you have that interim stub of hose. If you can picture it, can you picture it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, then at the T, there's nothing there. It's just the press fit. The shark bites do not come out. You have to hold one part of it in order for it to come out. It's a very nice system, very quick connect system. So T's, there's three T's in this system. Mm -hmm. Well, actually much more because every, every tower hung. Mm -hmm. So say you've got this tower and so forth. So instead of doing T's there, could we not just make holes in them? Yeah. Even if they need to be big, that'll save us in a lot of like uh, T's. Oh yes, we will need a lot of T's, but that's the kind of detail you got to get exactly right. What you'll find is that unless you drill it exactly at the right thing, it won't be at the right <laughs> angle and you'll start spilling. Mm -hmm. So that's what happens. Unless you fix it very tightly, that's not easy to do. So the fitting has the advantage that it allows you to rotate it to exactly the, the right degree, okay. which is something you can do once you c once you drill the holes. Yeah. They're mm -hmm. fixed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The T pipe? Uh -huh. Yeah, but we're talking about. We're, the we don't need to. We have these fittings. We have a box yeah, of these. The mm -hmm. They're $3.50, oh, okay. but they're, they're part of the. T critical technology here to get <laughs> the water flow right. It's a bigger hole so too than yeah. we started doing. Yeah. Right, so use mm -hmm. those. those are, yeah, I mean, I did that before. The simple lesson was like, uh, you, you have to, the whole sizes have to be precise and you'll get less flow <laughs> each successive one and they have to be at the right angle for it to work. And then if you're, you gotta have your, your plumbing attached firmly to, to the back there uh, here, this will be much more tolerant, and then we can actually shoot. So, what's the detail of a T? You're actually doing. So, take this line. You're shooting this. That's the first step. Mm -hmm. This ended up at the top, so nothing leaks. Mm -hmm. So it's all going down the tube. You so from the T. From that, so let's put more T's in here. There's a T there as implied right. and it's shooting straight down now if we find that we need to what we can do is this at this T we can go mm. 180 how about we shoot it up in which case you have to do this And that's to regulate pre regulate pressure. Yeah. You would have to do that, but mm -hmm. you're not just shooting it up and hoping it falls in there. You're you're li guiding the water back into it, so you have to have enough length there, enough loop, because the pex is pretty stiff. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna have to have enough mm -hmm. bend radius there to make it work. Um, but you can like then just get the correct length and make it work perfectly with that. You might have to do a little attachment to the hanging wire there mm -hmm. so that so you got a little goes to the right angle you put it inside yeah, just the you're controlling where it goes because if you just make it go exactly down the side of the 
the pipe, it can just all drain without hitting into in the foam. So you got to shoot it into the foam, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when installing these uh, PEX uh, tubes that the T types T uh, valves are connected to, yeah. I guess it would be good to suspend them and then make markings for the width of each T. Valve. You know the exact yeah yeah, pretty much. You know that there's a fixed distance already, so pretty much know that you okay. have to account for the width of the T, which is whatever that is. And then are we yeah. mounting them to the same two by four that uh Yeah. Okay. So yeah, they're, are they gonna be directly under it? Or are they gonna screws. be on the side or above it even if we're because if we paint them up we much can't do that it. if they're undermounted. Um Yeah, put them like either like right on top probably like right on top of the screws would be a convenient location for them. Okay. And then so maybe you got the screws screwed we, in. We don't yeah. necessarily have to permanently mount them immediately. We can try out a few things before we do. We just kind of hang them on the screws. Yeah. You'll need a bunch of little stubs of packs because that's all you're going to get between them. If we mount them on top of the screws, they will be slightly offset uh, because T valve will compete with this with the space right on top of the foam. But it's probably perfectly possible. Anyway. Well, if we put the Tubes that go to the side, the problem is we can aim them differently. Uh -huh. Oh, put a little picks next to it and make it fit. We'll do that anyway. Yeah. Do we want to try without the picks and just all of them aiming down first to see how that acts, or do we basically know that it's not going to work? Try it without the packs? Yeah, just how? to see how it works. Just aiming down without the and, see, yeah. and see if it After reaches the all the way to the, to the end. So you have two towers only? How many towers you got in the case? No, he means that no. you, you mount all the T-valves, but instead of putting the text on oh, yeah. the T-valves to guide them in, just try to have them all facing downwards and see how that flows. Yeah, and then see, then see if it actually reaches the end or if it all drains like in one or two holes. Mm -hmm. Which it probably will. That's what he's asking. So what's the procedure as opposed to what we're proposing? Yeah, just just start out with all them down oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. see how that works. And yeah, then that's know, yeah, yeah. The get rid of that. That's like, sorry, that's... We should get rid of this one. The, the first... That should be the next slide. Right, this is the, the, the second step. Procedure step one. Try everything facing down. Yeah, absolutely. Because okay. we'll we'll determine well how much pumping power do we have here. Mm -hmm. So do one pump, and yeah, just mount all of them, and then we'll have to play with the angles. Mm -hmm. Or once they're all yeah, once they're all up there, it should be easy to just turn them around anyway. So oh yeah, finding that's the right angle yeah will be that's. Easy. That's the cool part about these fittings, they allow you to swivel. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. All right. Yeah. As simple as possible, but no simpler than that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a T on everyone. So you need a bunch of these. They're on a receiving table, there's a box of those. Um, so yeah, make mm -hmm. this connection at the pump, hang it up in between the two. In between the two, you probably have a a joist, so you can connect the T, the first T over there. How do you make the connection? You can do. What are you gonna do there? So what's an what's easy way to do? You can do. What's convenient is they have these uh, pipe. What is it called? Pipe clamps. C clamps, I think. It no. Um, Conduit clamps. Yes, they have these in plastic. We have a bunch of like these ones. We've got this in the shop. Uh, ones like this that are tan, tan color. Should be able to find a bunch of this, so you can do that. If you don't have those, what you can do is screw in two screws and hang a piece of wire in between them. Mm. You can screw the screw further to get tension on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so we can get these. They're in the plumbing section as well. Okay. Should be a few. I'll try to pick them out there. Yeah. Uh, so that's that. So we can get. So the trays are in the old greenhouse. There's a hundred trays there with the pots. So we'll get those. We'll bring some soil down and the, the three uh, concrete mixing trays. These things. these things. We've got a few of these already. Um, these things, these tubs with a perlite. 
that's uh, that's what you can use for the seating, the mass seating in the net pots. Uh, and then the trays filled with deep pots, 200 of those. Do like, let's do like two trays of this. It should be like, it's easily 100 plants. So like two trays of this and then two trays of uh, deep pots. Uh, yeah. yeah, this plus deep pots. This you put the net pot in there as you bury the perlite. So we've got two of these with perlite already. Uh, I'll bring all that over. So you can have a seeding crew. Get the seeds out, yep. Yeah. Uh, so there's seeding, there's this. How far are we on the closure of the greenhouse? Is that we all? got uh, opposite side to do... Uh, no, I've actually done... Yeah, all we do is glazing and uh, battery boards for both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, but the tea and the studs in between are done. Yeah, we, we still need like, um, the small shoes. Bends. Bends? Yeah. yeah well, I've, I've cut... Uh, all of them. Yeah, I've cut half of the bathrooms from one other side, but we need two for each. And uh, I don't Start. think there's enough. Right? No, no, of course you can find those pieces anyway. Uh, you know, we'll make one if we have to. But I, I, I'd say we meet, might need, if we're really efficient, we might be an hour to an hour and a half, uh, depending yeah. on how hard of a time getting with the glazing. And then when those are done, there will still be a gap in, uh, in the corner, in the top corner abo above the 8 feet modules. Mm -hmm. Uh, because the wall module and the roof have a slight stagger, uh, which means a gap will be even though we close the side. Okay, well that's, that's you can just uh, staple some net into it, I guess, or something. Mm -hmm. Or wood, right? Yeah, but it's a bit more cutting. Okay. And as far as the the planting uh, shelf-like things, Richard, can you get those and just mount them there? Will we have like four of them or two or four of those? Um, I think I saw four is what we're thinking of as well. Yeah. Long things that are like this wide, that deep. Out of wood, roughly, yeah. Wood, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they were meant for one of the last uh, former workshops, which we never really used, so we can use them, yeah. So there's that. How about the shroom team? The one-man team, no? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was yeah. working with the other. I'm oh, not okay, okay. part of the shroom team. Yeah, yeah I started. Uh, the uh, little pots are in uh, the chamber and they're being sanitized right now. So you got the alternator running? or? Yeah. Uh, How'd you connect? Yeah, just keep it on for forever because uh, we'll need it. It, it yeah. has like a, a hard stopwatch in there, so we just have to go down in three hours and reset. You don't. S there's not a setting for for. No, it, it, like the way you turn it on is for the time where there's no like switch. Mm. I think it has a forever timing setting on the other side there. There's one side, no. Uh, I'll go check. Like yeah, that. yeah, because yeah, that that will need like overnight definitely. How are you shooting it in? Uh, I put it in the uh, in the chamber with uh, everything. Want to keep it out. Box. I think mm -hmm. we want to keep it out because of the reason that you'd be like re-zapping the old ozone. So let's get like a, see if we can find a, yeah, like drape something and just shoot it under from below that it's kind of covered or like, yeah, something like that. So I think we need the fresh air for that. But you care less about actually cutting That's already the one doing. Like, and I, I got I got it down, mm -hmm. so I can finish it quick. Recycle the ozone? Maybe maybe that's good hours. enough. I don't know. I think, yeah, it would seem I think we did 75% of it already. Yeah, yeah. Do those, do the lids, put those 55 drums? Yeah, we have them, we have them in the in a back of the pickup. But I mean, like, is there a, like a sub lid, like, you know, like an eight inch hole or something that we could stick the um, ozone in and use like the, the small little um, hole at the bottom to be the pressure, the pressure differential so the, the ozone <laughs> recycles out slowly, you know what I mean? Like it'll go in, but it won't yeah. go out fast. Right. Um, you have to wait. You have to have a way to shoot it inside. Yeah, inside, uh, the uh, inside the buckets. So you filled it. Filled the 55 gallon drum. So uh, after 
So then we're going to be taking that. Yeah. The other thing is that we want to wet it up too because the, the straw has to be wet. So at some point we want to wet it and it's probably now because you want to you wanna ozonate the wetness to whatever we put in the water. Okay. So wet it, probably put it out, put the ozonator outside and uh, that means we have an extra step that we take this wet straw and put into the buckets. Mm -hmm. So probably, so unless we put the buckets into the drums already, we might have to sterilize that those buckets, just put them in there again, like standing one on top of each other. Because did you do like, oh, are you doing it in bu in the buckets? Okay. Like a fifty percent straw in the bucket. This is like fits the Okay. Okay. One drum, so I can one drum that can just cover the plastic bag and a piece of like wood. Okay. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Let's see what we got there. Um, yeah, we can, uh, let's wet it up. Um, <laughs> because uh, the, the mushrooms need a lot of water to, to live. The, and it takes some time for the straw to soak up the water. Yeah. So saturated, I mean, pretty much they want to be uh, completely wet, like the fruiting body, it's still like 90% water and all that. Now, the cool thing about the fruiting body is they're actually a high source of protein. I don't know if you guys knew that, but they're like 30% protein. So whatever's going on in the straw, they're extracting all this protein out of it, which is like, wow, there's all that straw and the, there's all that protein in the straw. I thought it was all just, just carbohydrate. Hydro, yeah, carbohydrate CHOs, which are fibrous fibers of biomass. So yeah, they, they extract all the nutrients from it and they give it to you in a fruiting body. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, and then the mycelium thing. Did you know that the what's the largest organism in the world? Yeah, it's not the whale. It's it's a fungus. It's like a mass that spreads over many miles and it's one organism. So that's the biggest giant that we don't see. You don't, because it's saturated. You start with saturated straw in there, so they got all the moisture in there. You don't, no watering in there. So there's no more nutrients Zero, it's zero, that's it. That's pretty amazing. Um, when, you, when they're growing, you wanna keep keep a bag around it so all the holes don't evaporate all the water so before they start fruiting uh, keep it keep a plastic bag over it and even when they fruited like I would keep uh, actually I would keep a bag over it so they they like a moist environment so yeah they like the humidity so yep all right so anything else or go out there and do it I'm headed out after this, yeah. so I'll stop by the work site and say goodbye. But okay. Yeah, it's been really good working with the mm -hmm. so yeah. yeah. It's good meeting you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then we'll see the hundred nice catfish on Monday morning. Catfish, not trout. They s the deal is trout get weakened up above 60 Fahrenheit. Oh. They are they really like the cold temperatures. They really like the cold, yeah. That's what so we got back home, trout. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we're gonna have to go to catfish and um uh, we gotta pick them up Monday morning. Beautiful little creatures. Yeah. <laughs> you can get to eat, right? Yeah. Yeah. We'll see what we and can they do. eat anything. Uh, so you can eat like anything. Mice. I'm pretty sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bring them here. We'll just drop it in. <laughs> With yeah. these presents, we'll go to. Well, well, can we play Catfish Blues by Jimi Hendrix? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Must. If you catch the mice, so like you can convert the mice into protein, so maggots, like hang hang the thing, and it, it will smell. But you hang the dead dead stuff, and then maggots get in there, and then they just drop off into the water. It's a way to feed fish. Uh, but it would be stinky, and and um, I guess if we have it closed off. There might be some flies that get in there, but you'd have to seed it with a fly too. There might not be flies in there. There probably will be some flies. So it's, they, they'll come in. Mycelium could also break down. Dead. My, mycelium is bioremediation. Like, oh, like there's stuff. 
about treating wastewater. There's, there's work regarding treating toxic wastes, like radioactive waste. They tend to break it up. The fungus is a, is a big deal for part of the nutrient cycle and, and regeneration. So, yeah, so think about like feeding that, maybe part of the aquaponic system, like doing the wastewater treatment mm -hmm. with that too. Yeah. Like can think about right? Filtering, yeah. They're, they'll, they're just sucking up the nutrients and growing it. There wouldn't be oyster mushroom, there would be some other ones, but there's all kinds of, kinds of, kinds of mushrooms. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's do it.